But I want to uh, uh, save the discussion to, to, to Honorable Sonko to, to take us through those processes because I think um, uh, you know our external relations was very key to, to, to the successes that was registered by the, uh, the PPP regime but more so by the post independent uh, government. So on that note I will call on uh, Honorable Sonko to carry us through. But before that, I recognize the presence of um, Mr. Tamunya. Thank you for joining us, sir. And then, yes. of this meeting. I think it's a, a very important occasion to share ideas about what has transpired and uh, what we have been trying to do, where we have stopped. Uh, it's also an opportune moment, particularly for the young people here, who have not had the opportunity to see what has passed, what has happened in the past, to get to sit with you, say what we have to say, but also give you the opportunity to question us critically, to see what we have been able to do positively, on which you can build, to also highlight where we have not been able to achieve what we set out to, and why were these achievements not possible and perhaps together we can find a solution which you can build into your collective experience and endeavor in moving this country forward. Um, my intervention is basically on the foreign external relations, as the MC said. Mr. Tal, who he says I call him boss. Yes, I call him boss, and I still call him boss, because when I started my career in the foreign service, he was then the permanent secretary. And uh, most of the time, in, with respect to the work in the foreign service, I think he played a great role in ensuring developing our competence and uh, our knowledge of foreign service and also the issues that matter when it comes to <coughs> pursuing the policies. And for that, I've always told him that I am very much grateful. And in this respect, I'm not the only one. Because we didn't have a school for um, for training diplomats here. So a lot of the practical on-the-job training he assumed himself. And for that, as I say, we are very much appreciative of. Um, briefly, I worked, I, when I joined the service, I worked in many ministries, so to speak. But that has been the tradition. You don't just get appointed one year, two years, and then you become permanent secretary without experience, without knowledge, because even if you have a PhD, even if you come out with a PhD, there are still the practical knowledge and professional experience that is needed if you are going to man that high position. There are issues which you don't learn in the university. These are based on what practical experiences you have been able to gather your career, so that by the time you reach the top echelon, you are in a position to have that broad view but also bring solutions that take into account the essentials that need to solve that problem. Um, I worked first in the local government, so I can very easily conduct elections because I had to do that. We had to register votes. We have to address or take care of uh, cases where you have to do distribution, food distribution, because then there was a lot of this drought, impact of drought. But then I moved to the Ministry of Finance because again we have to see how the finance ministry works, what is the economic situation, what are the challenges in the finance sector. Then from there I went to the Ministry of Water Resources and Environment and then we looked at environmental issues, the management of our natural resources, what are the challenges, what are the issues. And then I moved to external affairs where I worked. 
And in the meantime, I have shifted between external affairs and natural resources as permanent secretary, as deputy permanent secretary. But basically, this is uh, my professional background, and I think it is important that um, systems grow and adopt this method where those going to rule at the top or those going to manage at the top have that broad experience of the various components of the system. Um, foreign affairs basically is relations with other countries. And uh, this comes about when a country becomes independent. Our constitution clearly gives that responsibility to the president of the republic. And during the first republic, it was Sadao Rajawara. He determined what are the main outlines, what our policy objectives are, which we need to implement in the pursuit of our interests or interactions with other nations. Um, when we became independent, it was quite, foreign affairs was quite a small portion within the prime minister's office, because we started with, Jawara was first premier and then became prime minister. This was before we gained Republican status. And uh, the foreign office was a small office there, and it's the secretary general, then uh, Eric Christensen, who also acted as a permanent secretary. But with the expansion of diplomatic representations in the Gambia, that is foreign countries, international agencies that were sending their representatives in the Gambia, like the UNDPs, the World, the WHOs and the like, and also our representations in other countries, our diplomatic missions, the work substantially increased. And it, in 1976, it became quite a separate office by itself. Uh, and I'm honored and privileged to say that the first permanent secretary was Ibuta, al Haji Ibuta. He was the first permanent secretary of the newly created Ministry of External Affairs. And then by that time he was serving as ambassador in Brussels, so he was recalled. Um, briefly, I think our policy objectives in the Foreign Service is one, to uphold and protect, promote the Gambia sovereignty, territorial integrity, and our national interests. Number two is to try and mobilize resources for our socio-economic development. And number three is provide assistance to Gambians overseas within the limits permitted by international law. And the fourth one is promote international peace and security. And finally, or importantly, is promote human rights and respect for the rule of law. And I think uh, Mr. Tal has already briefly referred to this. I will in my brief intervention, and uh, here again I agree, I concur with Mr. Tal when he said the time allotted is a bit small for this. So I'll just give a synoptic view of each of these policy objectives that we mentioned, what has the Gambia done with respect to that. Um, I think in the international in the in international relations we have what we call bilateral relations that's country to country but we also have multilateral relations this with respect to international organizations international fora where states meet to discuss and uh, where a lot of the issues whether it's social development, economic development, environmental issues are discussed within the framework of international gatherings. At the bilateral level, I think I want to single out the efforts that the Gambia made in, to protect its, its sovereignty, to ensure peace and stability. And in that regard, I would refer to our relations with Senegal. Um, reference was made to the book by Bakley Rice, uh, I think, as Ibu said again, uh, that's a very cursory view of somebody who came into this country. I think he stayed for about two weeks and uh, came up with conclusions which are not based on any fact. And more importantly, I think the whole attitude was so condescending and derogatory that uh, that defeats the essence of the work. I think the challenge was we, we, the Gambian people felt they can manage their independence and uh, they set out to prove this. And I think the First Republic has substantially 
demonstrated this ability. We were able to we, we were able to take this country to a level which has not never been experienced before it, and also poses a standard which so far we have not been able to reach. With Senegal, in 1967, that was the first time of the visit of the Senegalese president, then Senghor, visited the Gambia, and then they agreed on a treaty of association. That was important for the Gambia, but it's also important for Senegal. Because from a security point of view, our two countries are so interrelated, they are so connected, that it is important that we have a modus operandi, we have a system in place that can address the security issues, that can address our social economic development, but also address the critical issues relating to movement of people, border issues. And the good idea they came out that came out of these meetings was not only the treaty, which had a component on security, it has on social economic development, but they set up a mechanism that would ensure the implementation of these treaties. So it didn't just lie in the office. And that instrument was to have the Senegal Gambian Secretariat. I know you have it now, it's been replicated again. But at that time, this was given focus, it was given attention, and was given the resources to do what is required. And uh, through that, a lot of the bilateral issues, critical issues that arise, we don't play it, we don't go to the media to insult each other. Even the diplomats don't go to see uh, the heads of state to complain. These are referred to the Senegal Gambian Secretariat. And then they look, they sat with the technicians, look critically look at the issues and propose solutions to the two governments to look at. And in a way, these special relations enable the Gambia and the Senegal and Senegal to be able to a the two technical officials, the two uh, officials from the two countries to be able to work together a common purpose to achieve a common objective, which is ensure stability ensure socio-economic development of our parties to the extent to which the two countries are interested in that particular issue. Mr. Tal again worked, was one of the officials at the Senegal Gambian Secretariat then. The Senegal Gambian Secretariat only came to an end when the Confederation came into being, the Senegal Gambian Confederation. And again, that came about because of the attempted coup. Uh, that coup was quelled because of the intervention of the Senegalese, which was based on the 1967 Treaty of Association and Friendship. So there was this mechanism has proved its work that in case of major threat to the sovereignty of the Gambia, the Senegalese government would be prepared to assist the Gambia to re-establish law and order. And an outcome of this intervention was the Confederation. The Confederation, I know it is the academics have written a lot on it, and I'm sure you yourselves, perhaps the older ones, have your views. But what I can say is that the Confederation tried to respond to a given situation because it was recognized then that really security is an important matter. And what is occurring now is that the initial interventions, the destabilization of states through armed groups, through armed bandits, started earlier. And what we are seeing today is, in a way, a prolongation of some of these things. So that security was fundamental, and it was good that this was recognized within the framework of the Senegal Confederation. Um, in the Confederation came into being in 1982, and in 1989 it didn't. It it, it was it came to an end, largely because there was a difference in view. The approaches, or at least the end results, were slightly different, and uh, the movement, I guess, for some for the other party, was rather slow on the Gambian side, uh, on the Senegalese side. So they decided to bring it to an end. But I think there are a lot of 
good things that the Confederation tried to do. And perhaps one lesson we need to learn is that relations with states takes time to build, even with people. It takes time to build a relationship, but also one has to be flexible enough, and at state level, the state has to be flexible enough to accommodate and uh, integrate some of the fears, some of the uh, concerns of the other party. I will not go far into this, and I, if you have questions, of course, I'll be only too glad to talk to this, and Ibu fortunately is here, he can also throw some light on that. In at the global level, I did talk about our policy objectives of peace. Again, that's an other area where our diplomacy on the, the First Republic played a great role. We have contributed a lot in terms of bringing peace within our subregion. And one of the major achievements, which is hardly mentioned, because perhaps it's insignificant, but I think it's very important, was the efforts deployed by President Jawara to help and ensure that there is peace between President Sekuture of Guinea and President uh, Hofid Boani in, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire and President Senghor in Senegal. As a result of the independent process, Sekuture uh, didn't join the great Francophone movement and certain rift developed, fundamental rifts. And for those of us who were there at that time, 